if I was going to ask you, what did you have for breakfast last Wednesday? Most people in this room would not know what, what they had for breakfast. But if I said, it, it, what did you have for breakfast with your mom who just visited out of town, or Obama, or you know, somebody big in that regard, um, you would remember that. And the reason why you would remember that is because of the experience that was attached to it. You had this sort of novel experience. Um, and so it really brought me down this path of understanding how, do we, how does memory work? And so there are certain things that are just sort of ingrained in our memory. Maybe not for everybody, but for a lot of people. Your first kiss. I'm getting old now, so maybe I'm forgetting who that was. But there's something about that experience. It, there was something about it that sort of ignited all these uh, connections in your brain and, and caused this new experience. For those of us who are old enough, um, I don't know the age of everyone in this room, 9-11, when that happened, we all know where we were. And this was quite a while ago. There's a new one, though. When you found out that Trump won the election, we're all going to know exactly where we were at that moment, or how we heard it. Or something about the experience might even cause an emotional reaction to us when we remember it. And if you think about that, that's a pretty crazy way that our brains are working. Our brains are trying to remember something, and sometimes it's attached to emotion. Sometimes it's attached to visual ideas and visual thoughts. The other thing is, though, whenever we talk to each other, and I do this all the time, and I, my team gives me so much shit for it, but it really works, is we talk in metaphors. So I'm like, hey, man, you're barking up the wrong tree. That, you know, to other, in other cultures and other languages, that doesn't mean anything. Like that really, like in, I, I speak German and Croatian, like that means nothing in those languages. It's confusing. But in, our, in America, at least, in this language, we totally understand what that means, but it's a visual metaphor. Without saying, you are making me angry, you're barking up the wrong tree. Um, same thing with, or barking up the wrong tree is like you're, you're, you're about to cause problems with somebody you shouldn't. You're pushing my buttons is like the, you're making me angry. And I don't have buttons on me to push, but that's a visual metaphor, and it's a really effective way of communicating. When I tell clients, like, yeah, we're going to clear the deck for this project, which means we're making all their projects go away just to work on this. And I use it on, like, constantly. And the more you practice using metaphors, the more they kind of come up. And you realize um, what that means. So there's a history of data visualization as well. Like visualizing information, it's a fairly new phenomena in, in its grandeur, like how we're using larger data sets. But it has been around for quite some time. It's just taken it a very long time to really take on and become sort of this mainstream. This is Galileo, uh, Galileo's work, where he was observing the sun with the telescope, and he noticed these black dots in the sun. And so every day, he would mark these black dots. And what he would notice is those black dots were moving. And then you can see little gaps where the text is here. These are cloudy days. This is Italy. It wasn't very cloudy very often. But um, so those cloudy days were omissions. And that's part of that data set, too. And I think that's an important thing to note. 1784, Thomas Jefferson was we knew him as like a very progressive forefather. He had a version of the Quran in his library and whatnot. Well, this is him trying to understand what types of produce are in the market or at the market throughout the year. So he had parsley, spinach, sprouts, all this stuff, February, March, April, May, June, July. So he would actually visually mark when these are at the market so that he can pull out his handy dandy chart and understand, like, oh, cool, you know, uh, broccoli's about to come in the market. Let's, let's make sure we get some broccoli. It's pretty cool to think that um, somebody was doing this this long ago. Um, not f around his time as well, in England, um, a much bigger scene was taking force. And this was with um, William Playfair, who created this. This is a water painting uh, diagram showing the comparison between the average salary and the price of wheat in England. So one uh, is, this is weekly wages, and then the bar charts are the price of wheat, showing that there is a correlation between both of these. Uh, Florence Nightingale was also a super awesome person at the time. She was a nurse, and um, she started doing statistical diagrams, the Rose diagram, if there's one you want to look up, that she was showing the Crimean War. Um, 
and how more soldiers were dying in the hospital than they were actually dying in the field. And by that visualization, uh, it was, she was able to help get uh, resources available to help hospitals with more um, effective like caring of, of patients and whatnot. So William Playfair, just to, to be sure about this, the bar chart he invented and the line chart. This is uh, the very first pie chart that he made. The cool thing about, about William Playfair that I like though too is he was like the total punk rocker of the time. Not many people liked him, he was not very popular. He was known to blackmail people. I think at one time he ran to France to evade some being arrested for some blackmailing episode. Um, and scientists in particular did not appreciate this form of visualization because um, in the scientific community, it was kind of believed that if you really want to see data in its purest, you have to see it all. So the tables that he was referencing, they felt that he was only picking the important things or cherry picking and only showing a little bit of that data rather than showing the whole thing. So fast forward to this. This is late 40s. Um, to also kind of show where we even were in the 20th century, 1948, I'll read this out loud because I can read it probably quicker. Um, Sirs, I have read the new Scientific American from cover to cover. And this was a time when Scientific American started producing pictures in their magazine. Um, it articulates, or sorry, and, congratul and congratulate you most heartily upon it. I'm gonna start talking clear in a few minutes. Like I gotta warm up my esophagus. And the articles are on a high level reached elsewhere, I think, uh, only by the English magazine Endeavor. Keep this up and you will fill a badly needed place in this country. The only minor criticism that I have is that some of the illustrations in Professor Whipple's paper are a bit modernistic. So he was talking about this diagram in June 1948 and it was trying to explain uh, celestial spiraling. And so it was an illustration because sometimes illustrations can explain things much easier than words. Um, but this guy didn't like it. And so I was always, like when I first read that, I thought it was really funny. Uh, one of our editors at Siam uh, shared this with us. And I was like, well, I wonder what he would think to this. Um, and this is a piece that we did for Wired Magazine in 2010. So eight years ago, we had two weeks worth of 311 data of, in New York City. And this was a time when 311 was like a new service. And the city of New York had just received its 100, or its 100 millionth 311 call. And so what happens with 311 is you call it, a dispatcher takes it, and then they try to figure out what you need. It's the non-emergency number. So if there's a tree down, there's a light on, somebody's parked in your driveway, you see a rat, whatever, uh, you call this, and then they're like, okay, I'm gonna dispatch you to this. They categorize it, so what is the complaint? And then who does this go to? So what we did was we took that two weeks worth of data and we condensed it into a 24 hour period. We start at midnight, we end at midnight, and this is the day. And you can see the total volume of these calls. And then we had like the top 20, 25 categories that people would call about. So you can see it's the city of New York, noise is the biggest issue in the evening. You can see that. And then during the day, you would see other things, like there's rodent. Um, street conditions, probably bumpy roads, lost property if something is stolen. There were some questions that we had too, street light condition. I'm not sure what that was. And I, it, wasn't my, it, it wasn't for us to even find out. But it, sometimes when you're looking at data, it's, it, that's the whole point is this, this like discovery of like, oh, there's something I, what, what on earth would people be calling about street light conditions? My theory is that street lights were on. And so maybe they were calling to have them turned it off. Um, and this was happening right around noon. So this is the other interesting part about this is you can see when everyone's sleeping and then you can just see the ebb and flow throughout the day. The cool thing about this, it was fun. This was actually our piece, that, one of them that ended up in the MoMA um, for an exhibit there. And um, there are no labels on this other than the labels of the groups. There's no numeric values. This is not for research purposes and it doesn't need to be. This is for a general audience. This is for Wired Magazine. So keeping in mind your audience and who is that audience and what, how are they gonna need this information? So the main thing about this is like, the story is there without the numbers. 
if there were a bunch of numbers here, if we had all these values set, like these are call frequency numbers or whatever, or a normalized value of some sort, um, when you start to give numbers to people when they're not expecting them or not interested in those numbers, one thing that you'll study, if you watch somebody's eye, their pupil starts to dilate. And it grows and grows. And then at some point, it collapses back to normal. When it does that, it means you've just given up. So when you're actually looking at math problems, you should try this like on your roommate or friend or partner or whatever. When somebody's working on like math problems, watch their pupils. They'll grow. And if they're working on it, it'll stay grown. But there's a point where you just like, screw this. I can't even read this anymore. <laughs> Too much. Um, and then it just, you just see that kind of go away. And so this, the point of this was the, the narrative is what's important, not the data, not, not the numeric values. There's a story here. And this is sort of a practice of what we do. Some of it is provocative, too. You have some scientists, sort of like with the William Playfair, I don't blackmail people or run off to France to evade authorities. But um, there is this motion of like they're traditionalists. There's actually one who's a professor at the business school here, Stephen Few. I don't know if you've heard of him. He and I are sort of nemesis. Uh, it's been a while since we've had it really a full-blown argument with each other. But he's like, everything needs to be a bar graph. You know, that's the information. And my argument is bar graphs are great. I'm not trashing them. Uh, they're great for making decisions, but they're not that great for communicating information to people to help them remember something, to help them know what the story is about.